Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the dual voice of boxing and MMA, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? You love giving it to those MMA fans <laughs> and, uh, out there a little bit, or some of the, some of the diehard ones you yeah. know, that haven't quite yeah. uh, allowed me into their company yet. You know, and listen, I appreciate them. I appreciate, I worked the fights uh, the other night. The unbelievable, we'll do, we'll do that later. Uh, we'll do boxing first, just so people don't think that I've completely betrayed them uh, <laughs> over to the UFC side. But uh, I was at the garden, unbelievable. Forget about it, we'll talk about it. It's, it's just incredible. But uh, a lot of people were coming up to me and uh, talking about the podcast talking about you know obviously uh some a little bit of boxing stuff but it was a ufc crowd so they were all saying we're glad you're with the ufc but you know I'm, i know that there's ones out there that you know haven't quite warmed up to the moment of accepting this caveman you know and and i i humbly uh, submit to the fans out there that i am a caveman in their sport but I do, I do understand a little something about fighting. That's right. And, and when they're standing, you know what? It's boxing. When they're standing, they're fighting, they're boxing. And even when they're on the floor, yeah, I don't know the jiu-jitsu, you know, uh, holds and moves and how to properly... Uh, Technicalities. Yeah, I don't, how to properly call it for what it is. But I know when somebody's good. I know when... You know, somebody even on the mat outside of my terrain, when they're on the mat, uh, that when they're using this and when they're finding a way and when it's, as I've called it before, when it's floor chess, yep. because it becomes floor chess for me. Yeah. Because, because in boxing, I, it's always about the intricacies, not just about who's stronger, who's tougher, who's, who, who's faster, but who's smarter, who figures out, who figures it out, you know, and... So I see that, but again, I, I appreciate the fans. Thank you for letting me into your house. Uh, thank you for being so gracious, so warm. There's a few of you out there that still got a little way to go, maybe. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But you know what, the UFC people that do the stuff that we do, uh, and that I did for all the years at ESPN, the commentators, the play-by-play -play guys, they couldn't be better people. Um, again, I say to him, I had to work with them. I was saying to them, to Brett and um, to his partner, uh, I was saying, you know, thank you uh, again for allowing this, uh, for allowing this primitive uh, primate, allowing this primate to invade your area. And they left. They say, no, we're, we're glad to have you. Well, so, if you needed nice. further evidence of your acceptance by the hardcores or by the people that are, I think are important, I bumped into Matt Serra and Ray Longo in the, um, in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel. I'm in New York this week and I was here to run the marathon. The Hilton happened to be the official hotel for the pros and for the UFC. So as I walked in, it was like worlds colliding. But the first person I see is Matt Serra and he couldn't be... He couldn't have been nicer. He said, to give Teddy my best. Let me introduce you to Ray Longo. Those guys were the best. And Ray Longo said, I love when you call Teddy the voice of MMA and the voice of the UFC because he understands more than most of the people that have been here for a while. So shout out to Matt, Sarah, and Ray Longo. Great seeing you guys. Um, but Teddy, before we get too heavy into the UFC stuff, let's get into boxing. Yeah, but before we get into boxing, we're going to be talking about a champion, a special champion, obviously, in the boxing so let me just take a moment to talk about another champion who happens to be here, sitting to my left, the champion of the Masters class in the New York Marathon, just as you said, just this past Sunday. He came in first, unbelievable time of 2.33. Congratulations. Thank you. Really, I mean, uh, tremendous. Thank you. Very proud of you. Uh, and, and at the garden, people would say, tell Ken good luck. <laughs> tell Ken good luck. So uh, to you guys out there, he won. He won and uh, really represented the show uh, really well, represented himself and his family really well. And it's just give a little, because what a thrill it must be. Really, what an experience. You're running in the New York Marathon with the greatest runners in the world. Huge field, 
you know, you got to go to my territory, Staten Island, right? You get on a bus, you, you leave in a hotel. I mean, you, you must feel like you're going to a world title fight. It, it, they did it right. I, I was very honored to be invited into the uh, elite amateur field, so I took the bus with the pros. They treated us great, but still very surreal. It's hard not to get choked up thinking, like, where I came from. I mean, the first time I ran this race in the late 90s, I ran maybe 320. If you told me I would, like, win any, not just my age group. I won my age group 50-plus by 16 minutes, but I beat everyone over 40 as well. I won by, I beat one guy by three seconds, and then the next people were a few minutes back. But if you would have told me that, I would have said, man, that's that would be great. But it would have been the same as telling me that I'd win the, like, super middleweight title someday. I'd be like, I don't think so. I just don't think that I have that. But like anything else, one day at a time, I started to get focused and set a goal, and it took years to get there, but here we are, and I'm so humbled and honored, and the people couldn't have been nicer, all the cops on Staten Island that sent their best to you at the start of the race. It was just awesome. The fans were out there. I saw so many people that I know just from being fans of the show. Thank you to everyone for the support. It was awesome, and I'm honored and humbled to, like, win something of significance. I feel super very, proud. Very, well, you should be. We're proud of you. And I'll finish it by just saying that we always have lessons in life and we always try to connect those lessons on this show uh, in the way that we can. And uh, a lesson right there is you never know what's inside of you until you find out. <laughs> you got to go find out. Go find out. Today could be the day you start finding out. Let's go, baby. Let's go with the boxing. Let's go. We had a good one. I thought it was an excellent fight. Super entertaining. Canelo versus Caleb Plant. I thought Caleb, he did all right. I mean, I don't, at times it didn't look to me, and, and you're going to give us the expert opinion, but it didn't look like Caleb was necessarily fighting to win. It looked like he was trying to be competitive, and I love Caleb Plant for the record. I thought he was using the jab nicely, but it's almost like Canelo was on autopilot his last few fights in that he'll just take the punches, walk you down, walk you down, let you get tired. And then when he decides to turn it on, which is what he did, he just blasted him right out of there. First time Caleb had been knocked down, he stopped him impressively. I mean, t I'm dying to hear what you thought on this one because it was vintage Canelo. It was exactly what I would have expected and scripted for the way, him, for, for the way I would have expected Canelo to handle this. What'd you see? You know, first thing I saw was I saw a really big freaking beard. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know if I was looking at Rip Van Winkle, who, you know, might have had a little surgery, you know, to stay young. But that beard was so damn thick, the first thing on plant, the first thing I thought was, how is the commission allowing this? Because in the old days, they would literally come into the dressing room and give you a raise and say, good, get that off if you want to get in the ring. Literally. Because there's a reason. One... In the old days, they didn't want you to have a beard because if the other guy was cut, you could get inside and grind your beard into, I know it sounds pretty gruesome, but you know, it is a tough sport. <laughs> and um, you, you might grind your beard into their cut, you know, something like that, or into their eyes, you know, to get an advantage, whatever. Um, but also for a cushion, that, that you gotta, <laughs> to hit the guy's chin, you gotta go through this, this much beard. Yeah, you know, so I was like shocked that Canelo's team, maybe that's just the conference, they said, it don't matter. I they think got, that's I could come in with a football helmet. We're knocking <laughs> you out. We're knocking you out, baby. Um, so I, I don't know. But that was the first thing that hit me. And then as the fight went on, and, we, and he was taking some decent shots, not a lot of clean ones, to be honest. But when he took a shot, he was handling what he had to handle, and he was showing a good beard. <laughs> I say, that's the word, a good beard. You know, the old timers would call a good chin a beard. I, I was like, no, 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 he's got a good beard. Yeah. A beard, like really a beard. But um, I, listen, at the end of the day, uh, I get what you're saying, because his strategy was, t if it was to survive, to win by surviving. That was his strategy, to win by surviving. You know, stay on the outside, you know, box, try to be elusive, uh, try to be a ghost as much as you could be. And, but, I gotta be fair, in all fairness, you gotta go with what your strengths are, what your style is, what your identity is, you know, what got you there. and. You gotta also be able to recognize what you can't be. You can't be an aggressive guy with a guy who's better at being aggressive. You can't be a, 
you know, in your face, engaging guy with a guy who's better at being in your face and engaging. You can't be in a firestorm with a guy who brings more fire. Yeah. So in all fairness, I get what you're saying, but for me, from my perspective, you know, we're, we're having to deal with this in the ring to get guys ready to do uh, this stuff for almost 50 years now. I, I saw him strategically fighting the right fight, picking the right fight plan for him. Uh, again, with the guns he had versus the guns the other guy had. And so he, he had to stay on the outside. He had to box. He had to try to frustrate Canelo. He had to try to out-jab Canelo. He had to try to outmaneuver Canelo, use the ring, all of that stuff. Um, but, and he won a couple little battles. You know, he won a few rounds. Yeah. But he always had the sense he was losing the war. Yeah. You know, he, it was like he's, he thinks he's keeping the tide from coming to the shore. But guess what? The high tide is, hasn't come yet. It's, it's undefeated. It's coming. And nothing stops. <laughs> it's undefeated. You're going to get wet. And, you know, so, look, for me, the, the real comprehensive answer, the right answer of giving our fans who are dedicated to the show, and I appreciate, we appreciate the hell out of them, the right breakdown of this goes a little bit more than just the fighting part. It goes with the matchmaking part. I know that most people have a problem being honest about that. Or, or quite frankly, understanding what really good is. And I'm not calling anyone ignorant. There's a couple of you out there that maybe, I, I, I don't know. There's a few out there that I have to use tremendous restraint with. I got a couple, maybe. Because Tony, let's say not, God bless anyone that's got enough time in the day to leave nasty comments on YouTube. No, no, you guys are special. Okay. No, no, listen. <laughs> listen, God bless them. They, uh, you know, they, first of all, they got to be in their, their grandmother's basement, right? <laughs> Sitting in there with Hanes. I mean, that's tough. That is freaking tough for anybody. I don't wish that on anyone. But listen, everyone has a different opinion in, in all seriousness. But it's amazing how people get convinced that this, that going back to Billy Joe Saunders and Plant, I saw him as the same. I, I said Saunders would get knocked out. I said Plant would get knocked out. And to be exact, I said Plant would get knocked out in nine. So I missed it by two rounds. But it's just amazing how many people, when the fight was made with Saunders, we'll go back to that, which I saw as a no contest, where People were like, he's going to win. Billy Joe's going to outbox him. He's going to win. And then we're Plan too. Uh, plan's going to win. Plan's going to do this. He's going to dust him off. He's going to teach him a lesson. He's going to do this. Gonna... And, and I'm like, you guys, I don't know. You're, you're, you're looking, but you're not seeing. And we've all been there, if we're honest with ourselves. And I know that they don't have to do it for a living. But still, they're not seeing that. They're careful, and I'm not knocking Plant, and I'm not knocking Canelo here. I'm just giving an honest, true, deep dive into this stuff, where they're picking, Canelo and his team are brilliantly, and Mayweather did it, brilliantly picking guys that are really good opponents, because they have an undefeated record and they got a belt. You want a belt? <laughs> you want one? I forgot my belt. No, I was in New York. I had to buy my third belt this month. Listen, this Canal Street's not far. <laughs> All right? We could get you one. So, they see a guy with a belt. They see a guy with an undefeated record. A guy who can box. Of course you can box. You're a professional boxer. You better be able to box. You're a professional pizza man. You better be able to spit a pie. <laughs> All right? So, they see that, they say, oh, he's going to win. Well, like, you guys are crazy. Because at the end of the day, they're brilliantly picking opponents that can't win. 
They can't win. First of all, they're not going to get a decision. But forget about that part. You, know, you think you're going to get a decision over the, uh, the golden boy in boxing that lays golden eggs? If you think that, go watch the first Triple G fight. I don't yeah. care which fighter you like. There's no way that you don't Triple think G Triple won. G won that fight. 100%. And you know what's funny? Tell I thought he won the second one, too. Look what's Close happened to Triple G since then. He's basically been pushed to the side. And Canelo, you know how Canelo made $40 million for this fight? Plant got 10 Meanwhile, Triple G, like, can't get arrested. And he well, he's beat, got a fight coming I'd up, argue, but you're right. Yeah, but I mean, okay, he's got a fight coming up. No, I, you're right. I know he's fighting a job. No, he's, he's been inactive way too long. And listen, he's got a, miles on that old dominant. He's getting older, and, and the, the ship may have sailed it's on, a, it's on the, the great biggest, It's team. one of the biggest injustices that, don't get, that doesn't get enough coverage, in my opinion. And again, I'm not a super fan of either guy. I, I like Triple G, and I like Canelo. But to think of what's happened since that since that horrible decision at least in the first one the second one i can i can live with it i agree with you i thought he won. i thought triple g might have got a gift though against uh darren Tranko. that was agreed a, I, I, I can i can live with that we're too. always here with the truth here i i agree but that first fight with canelo was like one of the I thought most he lost egregious both. yeah i thought triple g won both the yep. second one he won it with his jab it was uh not with the firefighting the inside fighting yeah. so much or the aggression so much but he adapted he used his jab but i thought he won it was closer but i thought he won but a good point. Crazy getting, tale of two cities. Yeah, but getting, well, true. But getting back to this, really, Ken, the, and I had to deal with this before I dealt with the X's and O's of the fight, the, yeah. you know, the, 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 the gizzards of the fight, the, yeah. uh, the insides of the fight. But <laughs> they, they're picking guys. Uh, you know, life is good for Canelo. 40, 40 uh, life, million bucks. Man. You're picking guys that really are, are, they're nothing but really well picked opponents. Do you understand? You're fighting guys that have built up records. And I'm taking nothing away from Plant or Billy Joe Song, but look at their records. They're built up like they got built up for this, to get to this. And they got to it. Congratulations to all the people that helped navigate that. Congratulations. Job uh, success. Well done. But they were they were built up records they were fighting these guys and canelo canelo's not the greatest there is he's beatable of course he is he already got beat we think he got beat three times but officially he got beat once by mayweather you know a special guy we get it but and then you could say i i hear you i hear you down there in the bunker i hear you I hear you saying, but he's grown since then. He's gotten better since then. Yes. That he definitely yeah, has. Yeah, he has. And I give him credit because he has evolved. He has continued to get better uh, in his journey to, to be the best fighter he can be. Where, quite frankly, Triple G wasn't. He got to a point where he wasn't getting any better, you know, with his trainer. Yep. And Bud Canelo with his trainer, he was getting better. And the trainer deserves some of that credit, you know. Uh, so... He's beating guys that are set up. He's picking guys that they can sell it, and, and they know what's going to happen at the end of the day. And Kovalev, another perfect it, example. Yeah, Kovalev was too old. Kovalev was too rich. And he Kovalev, had the belt. Kovalev was the kind of guy you could make quit. Uh, you could. Andre Ward proved that. Um, you know, he had a lot of wealth. Uh, you know, he, he was... The ship had sailed on his career. He was happy. He was satisfied. And what did he do? He put pressure on him, and he made him behave the way I just described at the end of the day, uh, late in that fight. But he, he's, these people, the public, some of them out there, like, really, you got to learn from this. you got to learn that he's not fighting Hagler's. He's not fighting hers. He's not fighting blown up Durans, who who blown up and late in his career was was would have been a real challenge, a real challenge. Not these guys. He's not beating Penel Whitaker, who went up to super middleweight once for a really strong guy. He was only Penel, the great Penel, was only a lightweight. He went up to super middleweight and beat a guy. He's not, even, he's not fighting those quality fighters with those kind of skills, those kind of abilities. He's not. As I said in the breakdown to this fight, that Plant can't win because he does a lot of things well, but nothing great. And if you're going to beat a real, real good fighter, some people will call him great, whatever. If you're going to beat that great fighter, you got to do one thing great. Yeah, do one thing great. One. And he didn't do one thing great. 
So for me, it was an easy call. You know, hello, my bookie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm getting down on, uh, yeah, Canelo, yes. You know, I, I have to lay uh, 400,000 to one. <laughs> um, I didn't know it was that high, but uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> I don't have to show the money ahead of time, do I? No. For you, no. But my credit's good. I, okay, uh, I'm in. I, I mean, so having said all this, and hopefully setting the record straight and getting people to think in a way that I think that they should once in a while a little bit, uh, he, pressure breaks pipes, pressure breaks people. Plant, I give Plant credit more than Billy Joe. He didn't quit, he didn't, you know, just, just chuck it in. Hey, listen, Billy Joe had a broken orbital, I get it. By the way, in a way, uh, also had a broken orbital in his fight against the former champion, Denaire. Denaire, that turned out to be a great, he also, I'm just saying, so, because I know some of you are, so, you know, you want to come out, you know, with those arrows and the boxing you know, world is full and, of guys that have you know, fought you want to start orbitals. coming out with that little, that little thing there to jab at me, or maybe to just do more than jab. But he made a decision. He didn't know it was broken at the time, but he was hurt, Billy Joe. He made a decision not to go on. Listen, he fought an okay fight, but he was getting knocked out no matter what. He no did question. what he could do. He did what he could do with the talents he had. And like I said. He didn't have great talent in one area, so he did what he could do, and, but it was leading to the same thing. In this fight, Plant did what he could do, and he went all the way to the end of it until he couldn't do it no more. So I give him credit for that, and I, he behaved like a fighter. I give him credit for that. And um, I, at the end of the day, he was jabbing, he, was, he, he grabbed a couple of rounds, but there was only one guy controlling the fight. There was only one guy landing the harder, more, effective punches, which pro boxing, that is what the scoring is supposed to be about. Yep. You know? Because they do want to put you guys in the seats. It's not amateur boxing, the rules are different. So they make the rules who lands the harder, more effective punches as the barometer, the criterion for scoring. So they can get you into the seat. Otherwise, they might not get you into the seat. So, I think at the end of the, again, Plant was doing what he could. He was jabbing, he was trying to control the outside. And, you know, he was fairly elusive. Uh, he was either blocking the big left hooks with his right glove or blocking them with his right elbow, blocking the hook to the body. Good job, good. He was prepared for those punches. And then he was doing a little bit of a poor man's for I'm not knocking him, he did a good job. But the truth is the truth. I don't care what you guys would like to hear to, to soothe feelings. I just want to say what is the truth. I, I'm, a lot of people out there, a lot of the, you're not going to get that over here. Where a lot of these, come, oh, they're going to say something because they don't want to offend anyone. They want to stay friends with everybody. <laughs> oh, they want to play that game. I don't give a freak. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not looking to offend nobody. I'm not looking to do, but I'm not looking to kiss nobody's, you know, bottom. I, I'm, I'm looking to say things that I know and believe to be true. That's all. So he was doing a poor man's version of the Mayweather where he get his shoulder up and but he slipped to the right two or three times to make the to make those punches miss and he was doing that good. He was doing that pretty effectively. What Canelo started doing, you should have done earlier, was don't chase what's moving the head Bang over here was not moving, the right hand, bang the right hand to the left side of Plant's body. That has stopped the movement. And he started doing that. And it helped. He saw instead of chasing ahead. But it took a while. You know, it takes a while for the pressure to build up to break the pipe and to break the human being. So, but he knew what he was doing. And that's why he said he might have been winning some battles, but he was losing the war. And Canelo kept putting the pressure on. Canelo, one other thing. When Canelo used to jab, the fight was farther apart. But when he didn't use the jab as much, then, then Plant could pot shot on the outside because he didn't have bugs on the windshield. You know, he didn't have nothing distracting him, nothing blinding him, nothing keeping him busy. So he could pot shot, he could use his own jab. But when Canelo started using his jab, big difference, big difference. 
that took away a lot of what Plant wanted to do and could do. At the end of the day, he gets in. Finally, the pressure helped him get in. People, like some people said, why? Why did he stop moving? What's wrong with him? Why? Um, because of 10 and a half rounds of pressure. <laughs> and it and finally, getting punched in the yeah, arms and, and the yeah, body. It finally got to him. And so he stayed inside there. And, then, and another thing that made it a fight that looked competitive, even though at the end of the day, I don't think it was. It, it had the look of it. But I think that That's a good looked, description. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. It yeah. looked competitive, but when Canelo turned it on, it was just like, yeah. holy and cow, it was get there. Go, the waves are coming. Yeah, it, it was... It was an illusion. Yep. You know, it was an illusion. Like, like uh, you know, when you go to the magic show, you know, and uh, it, it, again, it was the perception that only it's competitive, but no, there was only one guy going to win. One guy that was breaking the guy down. The pressure was starting to, starting to dissolve him, starting to, to disintegrate him a little bit, you know. And the other thing that kept it close, though, was... Canelo was throwing one punch at a time. He does that, too. He does that sometimes too much. He was throwing one punch at a time. He'd get in, boom. He'd get in, boom, boom. One shot. In the 11th round, he finally put them together a little bit. And he did. He put them together. I know he hurt him, and then he put, but he finally started putting them together instead of one. I, I kept saying while I was watching it in between the UFC fights, um, because they were nice enough to, they had us in a suite watching the UFC fights, and they were nice enough to, Pipe in the uh, the Canelo fight later. By the way, speaking of that, they have a cool picture of Dana White sitting ringside <laughs> watching the Canelo fight on a monitor, ringside, like literally where Rogan's sitting in this. Dana watching the Canelo fight, watching the boxing. <laughs> I love, I I love that about Dana. He just does. He just does what he does. He's like not concerned about perception. He knows it's a good fight. I have respect. Well, kind of like what we just talked about here. He doesn't give a rat's ass. Oh, I'm sorry, I never, I didn't mean to even say that. A rat's tail um, about what other people think. He, he, he's going to do what he thinks is right, and it's the same attitude here. That I'm going to do what I think is right. I'm going to say what I think is right. And Dana's the same way. Like, the people that like me, good. The people that don't, good for them. You know, it's okay. And the one thing I will say about Canelo, about PBC, who did this fight versus Canelo's fight, the Zone did against Kovalev, they basically got so disrespected. They made the, the Zone put those two fighters wait one to two hours until the UFC was done, so that then they would start the Canelo fight. This time they were like, "Look, you guys have an event, we have an event," and they started it. It was on. It was. It stunk trying to watch them both, but. I hated seeing Canelo and Kovalev waiting for the UFC. Like, come on, man, be a competitor. Get in there and throw think down. Think there was any competition between the two undercards? <laughs> Listen, I was going to say, no, when no. you were done with you're, the Canelo thing, I want to say, you're, the you're, undercard for the Canelo fight was as it, it could have been like in your local VFW. You no disrespect. Fans, you boxing fans out there, really, I love you, but they get like mad at me when I say that UFC is passionate and boxing as far as popularity in the way that the numbers the numbers on views during a show are higher than boxing on a regular on a regular platform on in a in, in a regular setting consistent fight I'm not talking about when you have Canelo against Triple G you have a super fight or when you have Joshua against Fury if that happens whatever that, that universe is going to be bigger because the boxing universe is larger uh, and, and on that it'll be bigger but the universe of UFC has grown so much, so much, with Dana, simple formula, put on competitive fights, put on fights that anyone can win. Either guy can win. Even the guy with seven losses could beat the guy with one loss. It happens one. all the time. Yeah, because they learn how to fight. Because they went through the fight and they got forged to a real fighter, to where they fit, they belong. They can win at that level. And in boxing, no. You protect the guy, you keep their record undefeated by giving them, you know, by giving them a liquid diet of opponents, and then sometimes they get to where they're going to have a, you know, to sit down with uh, a steak and potatoes, and guess what? They get indigestion. Hard We've seen burn. it happen with guess what? last they have handful a, of opponents. They get, they get a problem. They get a problem. And on the way that you're watching this happen, and they're fighting all these setups, these handout type 
hand-picked fights that the network and the promoter wants to continue to build their fighter, you guys are suffering through one-sided fights. That doesn't happen in the UFC. That's all I'm saying. And I'm, you know, I'm fighting for you guys, fighting for my sport, trying to wake someone up, which is never going to happen. But just that's why they have grown to the level they've grown with the numbers on a consistent basis, regular basis of being higher unless you get one of these, you know, iconic type matchups in boxing. Then it's, it's a different story. But, but you're talking but, like once every two years, yeah, well, maybe just, once a year. You, UFC, you're right. UFC was just valued. We know what it's worth. They paid $4 billion for it several years ago. It's probably I crack worth out eight. Of, I got such a laugh because McGregor's quick with his wit, you know, good promoter, of course. Very you good. You know, he's been doing some things that aren't good. But uh, genius promoter. You got to give him credit. And he, and he was like Ali that brought boxing into a different... Uh, you know, a different tax zone, uh, if you will, yeah. for other fights where you could make more money than they ever made before, where the promoters were making it all. Well, McGregor brought UFC for certain fighters to a place where they could make more money than it was ever known they could make, or yeah. ever thought they could be made before McGregor started, you know. And there's always a pioneer. There's always a guy that leads the way, and he was that guy. But I remember that funny quote when, uh, when they came out and he was on the stage for some fight. I can't remember what it was. Uh, it might have been Mayweather, I'm not sure, but, and it came out that, uh, that UFC had been sold for $4 billion, and he said, that's good to know, now I know my value. Yep. That, was, that, was, that was sharp. Now, now I know what I'm worth. <laughs> In other words, I am the, uh, the business. I am uh, UFC, you know, the, uh, at that time. And of course, we have other stars too. But, that is why you put on an undercard like they did the other night. That's why the UFC is going to continue in their growth and in their march to beating boxing on a regular basis in the numbers. Because look at what they put on on a regular basis. Look at the wars. Look at the, I mean, they put epic fights on that you don't even know who the main event is. 100%. You're like, at the end of that night, you're like, oh my God, who was the main event? I mean, the, the, the first fight of the night was, was one of the greatest fights I ever saw in my life. I feel like every week, I'm like, Teddy, that was a fight of the year in the UFC. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I'm like, Gaethje Chandler, fight of the year. But I feel like I don't even want to say that because I feel like I've said it 20 times in the past two months. So getting back to, obviously, the fight with Canelo and Plant. Plant probably did the best he could. Yep. And I give him credit for that. And, and he got $10 million. And, you know, just like when Tyson was around, the fighters are benefiting now from a star being around because you get paid more. You get paid 10 times more. You know, I'm just saying 10, but yeah. whatever it is, you get paid a lot more. And it might be 10 times more because what would the plan have gotten? A million dollars, a million and a half dollars yep. or something? I don't know. But now he got $10 million. So just like when Tyson was around, people were getting paid much more than the value would have been for those fights. And Canelo, he finally put punches together in the 11th round. The pressure finally caught up to plant. And... He also showed his, you know, his calmness and his improvement and his, his cerebralness where, you know, all fighters, top guys got to be smart. He caught him, the, this time he caught him, he, was, he wasn't catching him quite clean with the hook. This time he got him to stand up a little too tall and he caught him, he caught him higher and yeah. more flush with the hook, hurt him. But then he didn't smother himself. He gave himself a little space, a little space and he went over, whap, caught him that uppercut, finishing touch, finishing touch, smart, smart. And you know what that reminded me of? Tyson with Spinks, where people just see the end, you know, where yeah. he went through him and think, oh, he went through him like a natural butter. But he went through him not just because he was a puncher and because he was fast and because he, his technique, he made a miss, all of that. But he was smart. He, he, was, he was seeing everything, Tyson, at that point. That Tyson probably could have fought anybody at that night. He was never as good. Never as good after that. But he had him up against the ropes, one of the sequences in the first round. He had him up, he hurt him, and then instead of just throwing, that's what made him a great finisher. He went over to find the, 
the spot, to find the space, to find the opening for the next punch. I think it was a body punch. And he went over. Oh, here it is. Pop! And that reminded me of what Canelo did, you know, where Canelo caught him the hook. Boom! Hurts him. Instead of just smothering himself, instead of just rushing in, he, he, he goes over. He says, oh, there's going to be a lane for an uppercut here. Wah! And then, you know, finish him off. So, uh, good performance, but again, you have to, you got to remember, he's fighting guys. I, I don't want to see anymore. And again, I'm not knocking Plant. I'm glad he got $10 million. I was not knocking Billy Joe. He, he fought a real good fight up to that point, the best he could fight. And he did get a broken orbital bow. I get it. I get it. Um, but these guys weren't going to win the fight because of what I already said. I don't want to see them anymore. I don't want to see those fighters anymore. And they can keep doing that to complete this unbelievable contract that he signed for $350 million, whatever it is, um, and keep cashing these checks of $40, $50 million. I don't want to see them no more. I don't. I, I, I just don't. I want to see guys with enough talent to have a chance. In my mind, my cerebralness, that I can say he's got a chance because he's got enough talent, enough ability. And so I, if it's 168, I, I don't want to see these guys unless it's like Benavides. And listen, Benavides isn't the most developed guy in the world, but he's at least got talent in one area, power, one yeah. area, strength, physical, one area where I could say, okay, okay, I'll go with it, okay. I, I even, I don't want to see no more unless I see maybe a Charlo, and Charlo's a, 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 a not perfect, not close to it, but at least they get enough talent where if it's a catchweight fight and he drops down to, you know, to, to make a catchweight fight to fight him, I'll, I'll look at it because at least they got a, some talent to where they can pull me in to say, okay, I'll peek, I'll believe, I'll take a look, um, I believe that there's a chance. You know, all I want to see him if he really wants to put his stamp on the greatest, where people get carried away with that because there was too many great Mexican fighters, too many. But if you want to get to that, even think about that, go fight Better Be Go Go fight Bivol. Yeah, and then really, you to already me, went to up to light heavyweight, so don't say you can't go up to light heavyweight because you did it already. You picked Kovalov. And for the kind of money he's offering, I guarantee you can get those guys a couple pounds under 75. Yeah, yeah, because they could never get that money anywhere else. No. 100%. And 100%. I, I think that those two fights, Bevel and or Better Beav, are the only two real challenges. Yes, he could fight Charlo and, Be and Benavides, but I think we all agree that he'd again be a massive favorite against both of them, I think. Yeah, but no, against, he would. against better be of and Bevel, though, like that's to me is a s sincere challenge. That I agree. That's why look, I said. That's yeah, why I know, I know, I know. Way, I'm I'm echoing your uh, sentiment. Listen, I congratulations uh, in that fight. It wasn't a bad fight, but again, watching it from my perspective, from my seat, you know, I just knew how tide was coming. <laughs> I knew that. I knew all the beach chairs were going to be washed away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I knew that. I, and I some bathing suits. Does, doesn't make me the Mason Kreskin. I mean, he was a ten to one dollars. favorite. He was a ten. He was a ten to one favorite. <laughs> you know, that's a little bit of a tip off. You know, and I'll throw in one other name that I would. I mean, before you go to these, like I said, to these opponents you've been doing with, with Canelo. I'll take Joe Smith. I'll take Joe Smith. Uh, that's a good one. You know, and, and why, listen, I know, again, I know he's not the most sophisticated, developed guy in certain areas, polished, whatever you want to call it, but he's got such a big heart. He's physically big and strong. He can match Canelo's strength, his physical strength, which is important. Um, he is so tough and he can punch. And no one deserves a payday more than Joe Smith. So I, I would throw his name that, you know, if you bring him... You have me. Uh, you have me. Let me point out the, um, how good the sweatshirt looks that you're wearing from Box Raw, the 36 collection by Teddy Atlas, a collaboration between Box Raw and the great Teddy Atlas. Go to boxraw.com. You can check them out there. And if you'd like to receive a personalized message from the legend Teddy Atlas, go to Cameo right now, and Teddy will send you a personalized message. I've seen some of them, and they're beautiful people with family members that are sick or going through something tough. 
Teddy sent some nice uh, motivational messages, so check out Teddy on uh, Cameo. And as always, you can check out his audio book, Atlas from the Streets to the Ring. Beautiful book. If you like hearing about, if you want to learn more about Teddy and you haven't heard it already or read it, audiobook at audible.com. Thank you, my man. One thing I wanted to say there, because I want my man Rob to be able to get a little movie clip in there, which which I, I know that uh, Rob loves to do. And I know that the fans... The fans get a kick out of these little movie clips. You know, I wanted to just say, and as I talked about already, but I, I don't want to be told anymore about what a great matchup. You know, what a great matchup this is. What, a, when it's what I just said, whether it's Billy Joe or whether it's Plan or whether it's the three fights before him. <laughs> yeah. Really, that all the same. Oh, what a great! Oh, what a great man! Oh, what a great! I, I don't want to hear it no more. Really, well, I, I don't. And you know, I I want to I want to go and explain to the people why I don't want to hear it no more. To the movie, the first Godfather, mm -hmm. where you had that scene where that piece of crap garbage can Carlo. I'm sorry, I, I know it's just a movie, but what a piece of garbage. The baptism scene at the church. By the way, that church was a church that's on Staten Island, mm -hmm. the Mount Loretta Church. So after that scene of the baptism, uh, they go and they see, they take a little visit to see Carlo yep. at the house. And Michael had already taken care of all family business a little earlier. And they go and see Carlo and they say, all right, you know, Carlo, now you got to answer for your sins. you got to answer for what you did setting up Sonny. And he goes, I had nothing to do with it. He goes, stop. Don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. Because you insult my intelligence. Now just tell me, who was it? Was it Tatayo or Bazzini? And he said it was Bazzini. Okay, good. And then, of course, they're going to get rid of him. <laughs> but, but, you know, he said, just don't do that. You insult me. He said, because when you lie to me, you insult my intelligence and you make me very angry. <laughs> so I just want to say to the people out there that keep telling me and shoving it down our throats, it's going to be a great fight. It's going to be a great match. It's going to be, the, it's going to be unbelievable. He's going to beat Canelo. Unless it's one of the guys I mentioned, I don't want to hear it no more. You're insulting my intelligence. And it makes me angry. <laughs> I'm tired of it. Well, let me talk to you about something that's going to make you happy, and let's talk about the opening to the UFC main card yes, sir. Yes, at sir. MSG. We had Nashville's own Before Michael Chandler. Before we go there, let me say one thing. Yes. Because as the platform we have and the responsibility we have to our loyal friends out there, the fans, we're obligated. We try to give them something before they hear it. Mm -hmm. I got a little nugget to give them, I think before they hear because one of the next big boxing fights of course coming up and we have a fight plan for the people to see and uh, you know an episode for the people to see breaking it down with Crawford and Porter right I want to just make an announcement here that my sources tell me con con for sure 100% that and I know it's been going back and forth about what, whether it will be or won't be whether or not his stay with top you know all the problems yeah. with top rank He's leaving top rank. That, that you can take to the bank. I've just been informed of that, where this will be Crawford's last fight with top rank and Bob Arrow. That, that could mean Spence and Crawford it's gonna mean, coming up. It could mean it. That's right. Good news. And, and it will mean a lawsuit. It will mean uh, the, the fighting, these guys that fight not as bravely as the great gladiators do in the ring, not nearly as bravely but they go and do their fighting in a courtroom. They will be in a courtroom uh, fighting, and at the end of the day, the side that really feels and knows, as far as what they know to be, that they're on the winning side of that fight, and that would be Crawford's side. Yeah. That they have top rank in a position where they feel uh, they have a solid agreement that they have not lived up to. Uh, and that they will win that point in a court of law. So just want to get that to our fans that uh, that will be the last fight, from what I'm told, for, sh 
for sure that Crawford last fight with top rank will be the Porter fight. There you have it from Teddy Cronkite. Cronkite. Very good. Um, let's get into the UFC. We had Nashville's own Michael Chandler in tough against the friggin' monster of Justin Gaethje. Oh my God, what a fight. Chandler you can call I, monster too. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. These guys, I mean, where do you, you know, even one, one of them is Godzilla and one of them is Morpha. Yeah. I mean, they're both monsters. I mean, you know, take your, take your you know, pick as far as, uh, you know, what you like. I was, telling, I, I was telling Rob when we were uh, together yesterday after the marathon, I was like, dude, I'm out of adjectives to even use to describe these guys. I, I, I cannot call them tough because this is like a next level of tough. It's almost like we have to find a word that hasn't been invented because these guys basically engaged in a 15-minute face-punching contest. At one point, Chandler, late in the fight, just kept his hands down and took about six punches from Gaethje for no apparent reason other than to say, like, I can take everything you've got, and his face was a mess. They beat he the He almost got to a place. See, I always talk about this sport, and I, uh, I always talk about my sport and, and the UFC sport where amongst other things, one thing in common, it's 75% mental. It is. And to your point, when, when Chandler got to that place, excuse me, where he looked like he was just like, God, come on at me. You know, I'll give you another clip. Another clip, my man. <laughs> another clip with uh, that, that, that great movie um, with Tom Hanks. Was it Gump? Uh, I don't know. Forrest Gump? Yeah, I don't know if it was. Yeah, it was Gump. Where there's the part, there were so many parts of that movie. Yeah. But the part where he went in the war and he got injured, but he saved his sergeant. And, but his sergeant lost his legs. Yes. And the sergeant was angry at him for saving him because he, he lost his legs. But then the sergeant came to seek him out because Forrest had gone into the shrimping business. <laughs> the shrimping business. And he Bubba was out Gump. shrimping. Yeah, Bubba Gump. Shrimp. And he was out there, you know, looking for shrimp. And they won't find no shrimp. They were having a tough time. Like, you got to follow your dreams. You got to chase your dreams. You got to stay with it. You believe... Stay with it. That's destiny. What's destiny? You making it destiny. That's destiny. You make it, yeah, having faith. That is the ingredient to destiny. You will get your destiny. And he believed and he kept trying. And then Sergeant came and he was with Forrest and they were on a shrimping boat and they weren't getting any of his partners with him now. And, he, and he's, they're not getting any shrimp. They're not get, and there's a storm. They're out at sea. There's a storm. And he's up on the top of the mast. He climbed up to the top of the mast, you know, and he's screaming, come on, come on. That's all you got. It was like a hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> like all the other ships got destroyed. <laughs> there were no more ships. That, everyone got destroyed except that ship. And he's like, hey, that's all you got. Come on, come with it. And, he's going, and then when it settled down and it calmed down, there were no more ships. They caught all the shrimp. They became zillionaires, right? Yeah. So, but that's almost what Chandler was. He was like the sergeant up on the top of the mast with the storm coming, with lightning coming, with the rain coming, with the winds coming, everything coming. Come on! Come on! That's all you got? Come on! Come on! More! And that's what he was. And I was talking about this one of the interviews after the fight that I did with the UFC. Great people, good people that allow me in there. I appreciate it. They allow this peasant into their, to their thrones, into their, into their great place there, and just a, just a boxing guy. But they, I appreciate they let me in. And I was saying, I was saying that it was also like that, but it was also like the Rocky movie, where Rocky's fighting that big Russian guy, and he got dropped about 400 times, you know, movies, whatever. He got dropped a few times. And then all of a sudden he says, I ain't getting dropped no more. He says in the corner, I ain't going down no more. I ain't going down no more. Yeah. And he goes out there and he's getting hit. Boom! And he just keeps coming. He ain't going down no more. He made up his mind. The mental part. He made up his mind. He ain't going down no more. There's something to be said about it. When a guy makes up his mind, he ain't going to get knocked out. Usually he ain't getting knocked out unless he gets hit. Unless he gets hit a punch he doesn't see. Yeah. Well, you don't have time to, to brace yourself for yeah. it. You know, to, to get that will out in front. 
you know, to keep yourself from going to that dark room, yep. uh, to get yourself to go back to the light. Unless, unless you hit him with a punch that he don't see, he, you ain't getting him down, you ain't getting him out. And that's, that mental part, that's what it was like, to your point, that Chandler got to that place, like, you ain't hurting me no more, you know? Hey, yeah. Come on, come on! You know, and it made for great theater, but it, it makes for true life. That when you set yourself, when you get your will, that, that's steeled. You could, you could find a way to get through just about anything. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got to. So in that fight, you had everything. I mean, it was just extraordinary, as you just started saying. Um, I think one of the things for me breaking it down from a mechanical standpoint, from a X and O standpoint, um, besides just the, the wills of the two, because those were battles of wills, there's no doubt about it, was you had this great two guys that are really, I mean, they could go on the floor, they could go on the mat, they could stand, they stood the whole time, for the most part, and they're doing the striking. And the punches, the punches are coming from here. And they're coming from the shoulder level for the people that are listening to us, you know, without the visual, without the video, where the punches are coming from the shoulder. So the eyes are lining up with the punches and getting used to the punches coming from there. And what was brilliant was both of them, but first, someone's got to be first, Gagey changed the level because it was back and forth, ebbs and flows, and he changed the level, bang, to an uppercut. It was brilliant. Nobody really talked about it. It was brilliant because we, we, we see the obvious, oh, he hit him with an uppercut. But what was brilliant about it was that he changed the level from the punches where Chandler was zoned in to this, where his eyes were seen, and what did I just say before? The punch that will hurt even the toughest guy in the world is what? The one you don't see. The one you don't see. So he went from here, boom, to the uppercut, and that hurt him, that dropped him, that, yep. that's where. And here's what's even double brilliant, that made the fight even more amazing, was later on, when Gagey had the edge, all of a sudden, again, they're going back and forth. What does Chandler do? Boom! He changes the level in the direction of the punch to the uppercut, and he hurts him. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. It was brilliant. Listen, the card, we're going to go through every fight, but the card was brilliant. The whole card, every one of those people were brilliant. The women, the men, they were brilliant. Dana White was brilliant. I mean, give him credit. You know, put, their matchmaker, you know the, his name, the matchmaker of UFC. Uh, yes, I met him one I time do, at the uh, airport. Real gentleman. Real uh, gentleman. Uh, he came up to me. me second, and I remember man. right away when I met him, I said to him, hey, you know, I don't do this to too many people in a fight plan. Congratulations. You're good. You're good. The people in boxing, nah, Sean Shelby. not so good. Here it is. Not so good. Good. Good My job. Good. No, no. Well, you ran a marathon. <laughs> you ran a marathon, brother. I mean, it's okay. You're good. You're good. But, um, I'm, I'm trying, you know what? I'm trying to remember more because it was almost too much to, yeah, to bring agree. in. Right? I agree. It was like being in a, a tornado and trying to explain to people what the experience was like. When the and, mask and, got ripped off, when the spinnaker it, flew away, you were just it, like, what when the When a chair came flying across the bow, <laughs> when a couch came flying, when a cow came flying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you know, really? Yeah, it was crazy. Oh, yeah, it was uh, spectacular. Th th that fight was worth the entire pay-per-view. It was, you could have paid, if you, if you would pay $70 just to see that fight, I'd be like, oh, that's good value. That's, the, that's entertainment. And congratulation to Gaethje, claimed his spot for the number two spot. It looks like he may be next in line to get the winner of uh, our man Dustin Poirier on December 11th against Charles Oliveira in Vegas for the, uh, for the title. So that'll be interesting to see. Uh, a lot of people calling for- That um, Oliveira, um, 
Poirier fight fight's going to be a great fight. Oh, hell yeah. It's going to be a tough fight. Oh, my God. I mean, yeah. again, again, exhibit A in a courtroom, uh, in a courtroom, if I'm fighting and trying to explain to the boxing people, I, my boxing fans, who I love, because I don't love all boxing people, but the boxing fans that I love, uh, the reason why I talk about UFC is they're entitled to be talked about that their ratings went up because they put on fights where you could make an argument that either guy could win. There's not too many of those. There's not too many of those fights put on in boxing on a regular basis. On a regular basis. And if you hear some talking outside, this is the real deal here, baby. <laughs> I was just we, about to say. We are in New York City at <laughs> Trinity with Martin Snow, who's also a star of a reality show. He's a former fighter, and uh, we he we are in his gym in Manhattan. And we have people, fighters, out there that are stopping by, and, and regular people. Just oh, by the people way, that he's, train, train, he's that training are, his people out there because we're and, in the gym. And because we're in the gym, three. he's out on the streets of Manhattan. He's, he's out on the sidewalk, uh, training, working with fighters because they're good enough to let us have this space. And there's a little bit of a crowd also coming in and saying, what's going on over there? They, uh, they're talking about some fights, yeah. And they're being entertained by, oh, the great Martin Snow. Mm -hmm. All right, so Teddy, we could probably talk about Gaethje and Chandler for p two hours and write a novel about it. There was so much that happened in that fight. It was t t beyond words. But let's jump into the fight with Rose and Wei Li Zhang. Um, rematch, Rose finished her in the first fight. They went to war again. What a fight. Technically savvy, two savages. How'd you like that one? And... Um, what were the key takeaways there for, for, for you? Great fight, again, you know, and, stand, and just stay into the standards of UFC. I love just, Rose. Just, uh, I, I love them both. Yeah. I mean, first thing, my thoughts, geography. Again, for me, one of the most important things inside here, inside the cage, whatever, geography. Who owns the geography that is best suited for their skills? And who gets that geography? You know, who gets the geography? Uh, they both battle to get that. You know, Wei Li, uh, a little bit more on the mat, use her strength, her physicality, uh, her great, you know, abilities there. Uh, Rose, more standing, striking, uh, terrific striker and long arms, uh, tall, where she can have an advantage by boxing, uh, traditionally boxing, where you're on the outside, you know, controlling the ring, controlling space. Uh, and here's what made it so great. They both took turns going into the other person's geography and having success. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty special. They both took turns because, yeah, Rose is boxing, but she's got an advantage, supposedly, and she's striking. And all of a sudden, she doesn't use, you know, a couple times she didn't use her length 100% where she should have used jab maybe a little more and got full extension on her punches to control and use her legs on the outside to keep that space from arguably maybe the more physical Wei Li. But then Wei Li does something while they're striking. Wei Li gets patient, pulls back a little and forces or gets Rose to give up her height, give up her length a little bit and get aggressive and come in and then she counters her. Yeah. That, that's just strategic. And it's brilliant because you're doing it in a place that is uncomfortable, a place, you know, where you're being threatened. You, to think calmly in that kind of environment, that's brilliance. That's genius. That's, that's, that's why they're so special. And that's what they both took turns doing. Wei Li, again, she, she's getting outstruck. Uh, and all of a sudden, she's got to find a way to get Rose to give up her height. And there's two basic ways to do it in my world. One is to work your way in, move your head, use your jab, you bring your feet, work your way in. The other is to get the other person to voluntarily or involuntarily give up their height by drawing them in. So Wiley picked that choice where she pulled back, she, drew, she got Rose to be overly aggressive, maybe a little bit, uh, and give up a height, walk in, and then she counted her. 
And then what does Rose do? Rose shows, I can go into your geography, you go into mine, you get me uh, the better of me in my geography, you figure it out a way, I get better of you. Not that either one of them had a big advantage in either you know, space, but I'll go on the mat with you and I get better position, I get on top of you and I get better position and I'll be able to you know, hold my own in that area yeah. and maybe have an advantage in that area. At the end of the day, really close fight, uh, really close fight. I, I had it, I think, three to two yeah. uh, for Rose, but really, again, just a tremendous representation of the brand uh, of UFC and of the brand of these special people, yep. their own brand, their own code, that they're willing to go to dark places to find the light. Yep. Um, that's it for, with that fight. I mean, unless you want to go. No, and, that's uh, a perfect summation. I know we have a lot to do. That's a perfect summation. Brings us to the main event, the main course, if you will. Um, Kamaru Usman defending his title in a rematch against Colby Chaos Covington. And uh, pretty good war of words leading up to this one. I, I'm personally not a fan of Colby. Some of his trash talk getting very personal with Kamaru. And, uh, but Kamaru I don't think anybody likes that. But, no. but in his mind, I think, even though you think it speaks to the person he is, I don't know that it does. I think it speaks to who he thinks he has to be to make more money. Yeah. I think it speaks to who he thinks he has to be uh, following in line with the McGregors and that kind of stuff. To, to, to play be, a character. Yeah, to play a character, to play a villain, uh, to get paid more, yeah. to promote your stuff. Yeah. I really do. I, I agree with you. And um, But leading into the fight, it looked like there was some bad blood. Obviously, Camaro had already had a victory over and broke his jaw in the first fight, although Kobe refuses to acknowledge that his jaw was broken and won't let anyone share his medical records, which I think is kind of funny. Um, nevertheless... Got a lot of pride. Yeah, know. yeah, no, I know, but I mean... He, everyone heard him yeah. tell his corner that he broke my jaw. Um, but he didn't know at that time either yeah. because you don't know. Of course. You know, I mean, I know people are going to say, Teddy, come on, you know you get your jaw. To a degree, but you don't really know to that x-ray tells That's you. That's right. Yeah, sure, it shows how it's broke. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you can feel a click and maybe yeah. a dis uh, disconnect, uh, you know, obviously yeah. some pain. But, um, and you obviously see the swelling. But... But they brought the heat again. The fight lived up to all expectations. I mean, five-round war. They went to war, and it was nice to see them at the end share some kind words and show some uh, mutual respect. Beautiful. And I think that just lends credence to your comments about Kobe pay playing a character. Um, but awesome fight. Tell me what you saw. What did you think of the technicalities, the X's and O's? All right. First of all, there's different talents. There's physical talent. You know, what can show itself in physicality, physical strength, power, and then, of course, speed, you know, and then you got technical talent uh, and expertise, if you will, uh, you know, in that area. But there's also a talent that doesn't get talked about enough because it's not, doesn't have a neon attached to it, a light attached to it. Well, I talk about it all the time, I talk about it for 25 years on ESPN, and some guys win, win titles with this talent more than those physical attributes that come from birth, from genetics. They're not lucky enough to have some of those, uh, so they develop whatever talent they have to the utmost, or with whatever way they can, um, with hard work um, and proper direction. But there's another talent, a talent that's attached up here, a talent of being dependable. That's a talent in my book. That guy is dependable, reliable, steady, consistent. Talent, 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 talent. And Usman's got a lot of that besides a lot of the other stuff. He is, he is a consistent, reliable guy. And he goes about his business in such a way, and that's one of his strengths, that he, is, he doesn't get outside himself. Like Michael Jordan would say, you don't get outside of the game. You stay within the game. You don't, you don't let it control you. You control it. And he has that ability where he's, he's very contained, very reliable, very steady, and very physically strong. And he's very good technically. He, he's got all his boxes checked. And he showed that advantage because early on, the first two rounds, 
his physical strength, of course, but his ability to be technically more controlled, uh, less risky, uh, more in control, more contained, where Covington, a little more reckless. And here's a funny thing I want to say right now. I always said this in boxing, and my mentor, Costamano, used to say, Teddy, show me someone's personality, I'll show you the way they fight in the ring. People were like, what? 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 <laughs> what? So true. So true. And I'll tell you how they behave in life, too. So true. You, you show me their personality outside, I'll show you how they fight. Ali, Muhammad Ali, a real clever guy, witty guy, smart guy, you know, thoughtful in so many of those dimensions, you know, outwit you, you know, with the words and with the everything and with his actions, right? And he, he fights that way. And then you get a Joe Frazier, guy, a hard-working guy. He, you know, everyone thinks he was from Philly. He trained in Philly, but he, he was from South Carolina. A hard-working guy that worked the fields, that, that busted his back. Just a regular hard-working guy, not a lot of words, action. Just, just about getting, getting to the mission, getting to the point. That's how he fought. That's how they both fought. Same thing here. The personalities are attached to the action, attached to, their, attached to their style, how they approach the game. Same thing, where Covington, you know, like you're talking about crazy, you know, we're all this crazy, crazy like a fox, but we're all this crazy behavior and everything. And, and, and he'll fight a little bit more looser, you know, with the loose behavior, he'll fight looser, take more chances, more rec. And the other guy sort of doesn't speak much, doesn't say much, uh, you know, very short on words. Same thing in the ring. Just, just does what has to be done, what makes sense to be so done. Doesn't waste anything. And that's, that's Usman. Doesn't waste anything, always in position, always balanced, you know, always ready to throw something with bad intentions without losing position. And that served him big. Almost won the fight in the second round. Served him big. He caught, he caught uh, their striking, which people figured they were going to do. They're, they're, they're both... Obviously, very good on the on the mat too, but they're striking, and he catches them two beautiful left hook counter left hooks. Catches him coming in a little reckless, right? He drew him in. He catches him. He drops him. And here's the thing that makes it unbelievable: he drops him. He hurts him badly, and then they get on the floor, and you know. Covington knew how to survive. His instincts were very good. Uh, the only way he was going to survive when he got up was to kind of find the cave. Find a cubby hole. He went down underneath, yep. like in between his legs, just to survive. Because sometimes you got to survive to win. That's right. You got to survive first. You know, some fighters fight only to survive. And we say, we call him on it. Oh, he was just fighting to survive. But some guys have to, if they keep fighting just to win at that point, um, they're going to lose. Yep. Because he's hurt. He's, he's been compromised. But he was smart enough, instinctive enough to fight, to survive, to put himself in a position so he could fight later. And he did. And he did. And so he survived that moment, and boy, oh boy, he had to pay a price for that. Because when he put himself in that position, he left his body open. And, you know, I always talk about putting water in the basement, going to the body. But, you know, but Usman showed his own version of putting water in the basement. He barbecued ribs. <laughs> he barbecued ribs. He, he, I will be shocked. If I haven't heard reports, I don't know if you have, I don't know if Rob has, but I haven't heard any reports. If Covington didn't break a rib, I'll be shocked. Yeah. Because he was crucifying him. He was hitting him with shots to with nothing holding back, just clean shots right to the ribs. That's Not crazy. blocked. Right to the ribs. I'd be shocked if he didn't have a broken rib. But he again, he behaved the way the code of a samurai, the code that these guys have, that I'm willing to go where I gotta go to get to where I wanna get to. And he tolerated, he endured that. He endured that. And he got through that. And then he has his moment. And he comes back in the second half of the fight and wins rounds. It's and, crazy. Oh, oh, wow. And, and I wanna add one other thing. Covington, you're great. Usman, you're great. I mean, will and skill, the whole shamboozle, the whole damn thing. I think that there's an X factor for a special guy like Usman. They're talking afterwards, the guys that, that were there uh, doing the, the real experts at the UFC. I have none but respect for them. They, they were calling Usman the greatest welterweight champion of all time. And 
there's an X factor. There was an X factor with Ali, if you want to call him the greatest, or there's an X factor for me. And I talked about this on one of the interviews I did that night. Usman is attached to a region of the world that, that comes from where there's sort of a understanding of a commitment, a responsibility, if you will, of behavior, of code, of behaving like a warrior. Like it's almost it's almost like part of the culture, but it's passed on. It's, it's somewhere you're expected to behave like a warrior. Kind of like Khabib. Khabib comes from a region of the world, too, where that's passed on, where that's taught, that's expected. It becomes a responsibility for you to sort of carry that, to represent your people in an honorable way, in a strong way. And I see that with him, and I think that's a strength that... Canelo has connected with the Mexican people, the great Mexican people, that Pacquiao has, I'm mentioning all greats, that Pacquiao has connected to the Filipino people, that Khabib has from his part of the, that that, that washes over the, the rest of it. All the physical stuff I just explained and went down the list, all the, it kind of washes over and gives a coat of armor, a coat of special armor to make those guys just a little better, a little more special. That's what I saw, and that's what I appreciate, that's what I admire, that's what I respect, that's what I want to bring in the way that I hope I can bring it, um, because they deserve that to be brought out, you know? And, um, go ahead, baby. Yeah, were there so two others on the, um, the two other events on the uh, main card, if you want to touch on those just real quick? I know we're uh, trying to hustle, <laughs> like we said, we're at the Trinity Boxing Club and um, Martin's got train people out there training him in the street. Uh, He's we the best. He's the best. Yep. And by the way, quick uh, shout out to Teddy's Dynamic Striking. If you want to check out some of Teddy's boxing instructional videos, you can check them out at dynamicstriking.com. We'll go over Quarantillo and Burgos. Yeah. Uh, all right, now, Would you like that? Yeah. Uh, listen, great fight. Billy Great Q. fight. Great yeah. fight. I want everyone to know, great fight, great fight, great fight. Another one, just like the rest of them on that card. They know how to do it. Here was the problem with that fight. As great as it was, it was kind of like a tremendous band going on stage after the Rolling Stones just left. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, would someone <laughs> tell me the Rolling Stones was booked before me? Rob, you're a manager, you're a producer. Couldn't you have told me that? I mean... That's what it was like. Or a young I, comedian going I, I, up after Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, because this was a great fight. I mean, uh, Quarantillo, he was like Joe Frazier. Really, coming forward, you know, being determined to, to win this fight. But he had one problem. Burgos was like Ali. <laughs> 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 that, was, that, that, was, that was the only problem. And Burgos won the decision. Um, but not before they gave us really really a great fight yeah yeah that was a great one but yeah, like you said it's unfortunate they had to follow chandler and gaethje um the other one was edgar and vera oh frankie edgar the legend and cheeto vera i want to say one thing really where do you guys get these 40 year olds from <laughs> i mean strong island uh, yeah I'm, well there it is edgar <laughs> 40 years old, we just watched Texera, yep. 42 years old, extraordinary. He just won the world title uh, at light heavyweight. Unbelievable, just unbelievable. All the credit, all the hats. I wish I had, if I had hats, if I had a toupee, I'd take it all off. <laughs> I'd, I'd take my hair off, my hat off. I mean, but where do you get these 40 years old guys? Um, he had the edge, Edgar, uh, in getting the geography I talk about yeah. that suited him best, he wanted in the first round. He did, but it didn't last long. The second round, Vera, you know, Vera took control, uh, took over a little bit. He got the geography, and uh, I was, I was, again, I was just, I, I was just amazed again by these forty-year-olds. You know, yeah. that they, you, you watch one a week, what, two weeks ago in yeah. Texas, and then yep. you, you see this. But um, all of a sudden, uh, 
And Frank Yeager is a surefire Hall of Famer. He's been around forever. You know what Andy. you're getting every time he shows up. He sprints from the locker room to the ring. He brings the heat every time. He's uh, like one of those steady, dependable guys. You know what you're getting. Give all the credit to Vera. He, yep. was, he was well-rounded. He was well-prepared. Uh, very versatile. And, you know, I've seen in my business, obviously, I've seen fighters walked into punches. I've never yep. seen one walked into a kick. Mm -hmm. And that's what Vera did. He walked Edgar into a front kick. Oh, and not so him. beautiful. I mean, what a set. And, and he just, he set him up. He set him up. And he, he had him frozen. He never expected the kick to come from there, right down the middle. Yep. Because, you know, he had him thinking about the punches. And it was a brilliant setup. Again, I can't say it enough that these guys, we know how tough they are. We know how physical they are. We know how gifted they are. But they're smart. That's what separates them. That was a smart move under difficult conditions, uh, you know, in, in a terrain that is hard to think clearly. It was... It's the way, and I'll finish this with this. It was tantamount, it was comparable to when you watch a great pitcher in baseball where he sets up a great hitter, where he'll throw a few curveballs, you know, he'll change the speed a little bit, he'll go up and down a little bit, and then whoop, he throws a 95 mile an hour fastball down the middle, and you see the hitter just frozen. Yep. Frozen! <laughs> and you say, oh my God, it That's came right down the middle. I came right down the middle. How could he not have gotten that? How could he not have been ready for that? He froze him. He set him up. And that's what it was. It was brilliant. He, he, he's got him thinking about the change of speed, about the, about the curveballs, about everything else. And then all of a sudden, bang, a kick, a fastball right down the middle, knocks him out. Brilliant. Uh, hats off again to the whole Don show. Frank Yeager doesn't get stopped. <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's that dependable. But yeah, great job by Cheeto Vera. Great job by the UFC. Dana White and Co. Congratulations. That was an awesome event. And uh, congratulations to Canelo on another victory. Thank you guys we for being We covered it all. This. We covered <laughs> it all, okay, for you. For you. Because we appreciate you. So we got it all in. Martin Snow, the great Martin Snow, uh, he, he's keeping his Tigers outside for a few more minutes <laughs> before, they, before they come in here. But um, again, congratulations to my partner uh, winning the Masters in the New York Marathon. We talk about will, we talk about character, we talk about all those things. You might not have noticed, yeah, he's in great shape and all, but he's not exactly built like a runner, right? <laughs> but what does he do? He goes and wins these races. Why? Because of will because of determination, because that was his dream, one of his dreams, and he committed himself to doing it. So hats off to him, and hats off to all of you who follow your dreams. Thanks for being with us, guys. Teddy, that was excellent. Appreciate you, love you, you're the best. Thank you, guys. We love you guys.